I'll let him tell you a little bit about, about his career and, and the kind of the things he sees coming forth. But uh, Ed Freeze, everybody. So, thank you. That was, that was the nicest way to say I'm really old. Uh, no. I'm sorry. I'm guilty of that. Um, I, uh, I did a talk down at KEXP a few months ago, and I know there were some AIE people there. Does anybody go to that talk? A couple? Okay. I think they graduated. Oh, the ones that a lot of them graduated? Okay, good. So I could have just done that talk again. It would have been so much easier. Um, I, I didn't want to duplicate the talk, so, um, so I decided, and that was like this fancy talk with lots of slides and stuff, and this time I'm just going to talk. So hopefully this will be more, uh, more casual and you guys can ask me questions and be a little more interactive. Um, and I, I'll cover some of the same territory, but I'm going to try to drill in a little more uh, into uh, Xbox and the creation of Xbox and things like that, which I skip over in that talk, which is kind of surprising. But anyway. Um, yeah, so I grew up here. So I was laughing when it was the thing about the winter. So yeah, you know, we we get through the winters okay in Seattle. Or, you know, it's probably why I became a programmer. You know, it's nice to be indoors. You know, well, we get all that music. Too. We we read our science fiction. We drink our coffee, and we we program. It's good. It's good. Good programming weather. That's what I always say. Um, yeah, so I grew up in Bellevue. Uh, I, uh, both my parents were engineers. So my dad was an electrical engineer. My mom was a chemical engineer. Uh, great inspiration to me. Then when uh, when we were in kind of later elementary school, she went back to the University of Washington and got a master's in computer science. So I got a programmer mom, I got an electrical engineer dad. We had lots of fun stuff around the house to play with. The only problem with back then was there, there were no personal computers. So, uh, you know, uh, my dad would bring home programmable calculators from work and that was some of the first things that I, that I programmed on. Um, and really the timing of my life was is just worked out well because I loved games, I fell in love with programming, and I was just right there at the cusp when interactive programming finally became accessible. So when I joined high school, that was when the first Apple IIs and Atari 800s and computers like that were coming out. And, uh, and my parents got me an Atari 800 for Christmas and I just fell in love with that machine and you know, started writing games. Um, back then, um, you know, in the old days, it was so hard. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, we didn't have an internet, we didn't have schools like this, um, but we had magazines, and so we would get these magazines and uh, type in programs from, uh, in basic uh, out of these magazines, and that was a great way to learn how to, how, how to make a game, how games work. And then you'd also learn how bad the computer was, how slow it was, you know, and how slow basic was. And so that's when you'd make the step to assembly language and start to code in assembly language. And so I, um, I started, and I was also, you know, we're talking about the early 80s now, it was kind of the rise of the arcade machines, and arcades were really big. And so you had these amazing arcade games. You'd go down to the, for me, it was the local bowling alley, and you'd see, you know, with Space Invaders and Defender and Donkey Kong and all these games. And, you know, if you're a programmer, you want to go back and imitate that stuff. At least I did. So um, the first game I wrote in assembly language was, was a game called Space War, where you've got two ships fighting around a sun with gravity. And uh, the second game that I did that really kind of all the way to completion was a Frogger clone. Um, you know the game Frogger, where you're a frog? You know the game Crossy Road? It was like that. <laughs> Before. Anyway, um, so I, I wrote this Frogger clone. I'm a, I'm a high school kid, spending all my free time in the basement working on my computer um, when I'm not with my, my good friends. Um, and uh, anyway, and I'm working at a pizza place, you know, because uh, I got to make money. Um, I worked at Shakey's Pizza, you know, and, um, and I would save up my money and then go buy a game. That was what the money was for. Um, anyway, um, and I got contacted by this game company in California, a company called Romox, and they had seen my Frogger clone and they, they tracked it back to me. And that was how I got into the game business in 1982. Uh, I was a senior in high school and, uh, you know, do you want to, they, they came, do you want to make games for us? It was like, it was like a dream come true for me, you know, I was like, yeah, I could quit the pizza place. I could make games. That would be good. <laughs> Um, but of course, that was 
you know, it wasn't like it wasn't like I was going to not go to college. It wasn't I mean, basically, the deal I had with them was they gave me some equipment and said, make games. And if they will give you some royalties when they sell. So it was like I was going to get some money at some point, you know, um, maybe. Uh, and so um, I went to college. I went to a little school in New Mexico. Uh, a little bit bigger than this one, but actually not that much bigger. I don't think our, our computer science group was probably about the same size as this. Went to a little school called New, Me New Mexico Tech. Um, and, um, and I was writing games for them, and I was going to school, learning computer science. I felt like I was a pretty hotshot programmer to begin with. Um, but uh, at school I learned you know, more kind of the formal stuff about computer science, and that was really helpful. I remember, I remember uh, like one of my first days at school there, I, I, I go into the computer science department and I'm walking through and everybody's playing Rogue on the machines. The original Rogue, you know, there's all these roguelikes now. This is the real Rogue. Um, but then I, I watched this other guy and he was like, he was writing code. So I'm like looking over his shoulder and, and he would write code and then he would put a comment after it and then he'd write code. And, and I was like, why would you do that? You know, I would like write these long assembly language things with no comments, you know. But I mean, that's the way we were back then, you know, we were just like self, self taught, self trained. Um, so anyway, I learned, you know, school was good. Um, and, uh, you know, so I was in, in college uh, from 82 to 86. So in 1984, something big happened in the game business. Does anybody here know what happened? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, a little bit later, actually, um, but although in, in Japan, you'd be right. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, was 84 the game crash? The game crash in 1984, that's what I was looking for. Um, yeah, so, so pretty much this game industry that had been taken off, it got up to about $9 billion in the US. Uh, it's over $100 billion today. But you know, 1980s, that's, that was a big number. It was a big fad, and then the whole business crashed, and it really went. It went from nine billion dollars to less than one billion dollars in a year, and all these game companies went away, including the company that I work for. So now I'm I'm halfway through college, I'm getting my computer science degree, um, and I, the game business is gone. You know, uh, so what am I going to do? So I get a job working in the uh, computer center, running one of their VAX machines. Um, and I finish out my computer science degree, and, I, and during summers I'd come up here and, and do internships. And between my junior and senior year, I got a job working at a little company called Microsoft. Um, and they were, they were pretty small. I mean, there were about 800 people back then. So um, uh, I worked there, they liked, they liked the job that I did. I got the nickname Fast Eddie because they thought I was a fast programmer. Uh, now, now I go by Ed, you can't call me Eddie, but Steve Ballmer still calls me Eddie. It's, Embarrassing. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, so I worked there one summer, and uh, then they offered me a job to come back the next year when I graduate. Um, and so I, I joined, not knowing what I'd be working on, and they put me to work on the first version of Excel for Windows. So I worked on Excel, and I'm going to fast forward a little bit here. I worked on Excel for five years, worked my way up to be lead programmer. The team went from, there were seven of us made the first version of Excel for Windows, seven programmers. It went up to, there were 50 programmers when I left five years later, and went over to run Word. And I run Word for another five years. And you're like, but you're a gamer. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I was a huge gamer on the side, right? So, so now I'm like, you know, pro coding at work, working on office stuff, which, you know, when you're programming, I, I think programming is fun no matter what you're working on. Sure, we'd love, we all love to program on games, but programming is the same kind of challenge where you're making something cool, and then you just get to see it work or not work, see it come to life on the screen. So I'm, so I'm programming and I'm sort of working my way up in management. I mean, I started as an intern and then I'm managing little teams, then I'm managing bigger teams. And, uh, but I'm, I'm playing all these games on the side. So, so, you know, now we're 10 years into my career at Microsoft and I'm to the point in management where the next step for me is to step away from programming altogether. I had been leading the development of Word as the development manager, and the next step up for me in the, in the rung is to be what's called a business unit manager. And I couldn't program then. And um, you know, I'm thinking, really, there's only two things that I love to do. I love games, and I love programming. And so if I'm gonna pursue my career, I have to give up the thing that I love, you know, programming at least at work. Um, 
And so I'm like, well, maybe there's a way I could do games. Um, the other thing that I really love, right? If I have to give up, uh, give up programming. And it just happened that there was a small games group at Microsoft. They were just really getting started. Um, but they had some interesting projects in development and they had an opening. The head of that group had just left. So I went to my bosses and said, hey, I wanna go take, they knew I was looking around trying to decide the best thing to do. They were like, well, why don't you go work on PowerPoint? You know, you could go run PowerPoint down in California. Like, yeah, I did, I did Excel and Word, I should do PowerPoint, you know, it's a natural thing. Um, but, I, but I'm like, I found this job, you know, it's like the perfect job for me. I wanna go run this games group uh, at Microsoft. And uh, my boss is just freaked out. And <laughs> they're, they're like, oh, Ed, you're, you're crazy. You know, they, they, one, one of them told me I was uh, committing career suicide. That's what, this was a vice president telling me this. You're committing career suicide. Uh, another vice president said to me, he said, why would you leave office, one of the most important parts of the company, to go work on something no one cares about? That's what he said to me. I love that quote today. <laughs> but you know, I went off, I did, I put my foot down, I said, no, this is what I really want to do, you know, and I had, I had earned enough political capital in the company to, where, the, I, where they're like, fine, they rolled their eyes and said, fine, go do that thing, you know, we don't really care. Uh, it's your, your career if you want to throw it away. Um, so I go over to this games group, and they're, they're working on some really cool things, and there are some great people over there, people, some people who are still uh, in the games group today. Somebody like Shannon Loftus, who's one of the most senior, uh, senior people in their whole development group, um, was in the team at that time. And um, well, I found out a couple things when I got over there. First of all, we had Flight Simulator, and Flight Simulator was actually making a lot of money. Um, and that was good. And, I, and what they said was true, that nobody at the company cared what I, what I did, you know? It turned out to be a really good thing when people don't care what you're doing, you know? <laughs> so it was like, okay, so I found myself in this situation where I had, I had a lot of sort of rope. I had a lot of freedom to do what I wanted because it wasn't like this core thing to the company. And as long as I didn't lose money, it was gonna be okay. And I had at least some money coming in from Flight Simulator. And the guys on that team had signed a game called Age of Empires, okay? <laughs> they, they were working with a little company called Ensemble Studios. They'd never made a game before. Um, but they showed me this when I was applying for the job. And you know, I was a big Command and Conquer, Red Alert fan. Um, and so they had this real-time strategy game, but it had this historical element too. It was really interesting, right? Um, so that was part of why I was excited to join, join the group. Anyway. Uh, that game, for people who know, came, came out uh, and was another big hit, okay? And so now we have Flight Simulator and we have Age of Empires. And so those are making a lot of money for us, which is great. Um, so, I mean, what would you do? I would ask all these people, if you were in my shoes, right? You're sitting there, you know, you're like 30 years old. You got people have entrusted you with this multi-million dollar business and then, like, don't actually care what you're doing. <laughs> I literally had, I had, I had, my boss, when I took that job, three months in, my boss quit. And so then I was working for my boss's boss, and then my boss's boss quit three months later. And then I was working for one of the vice presidents who told me that I was committing career suicide because he had come over to be over this whole big sector of the company. So anyway, um, what would you do? Yeah? I'd start working on Age of Empires II, the greatest real-time strategy game ever made. <laughs> <laughs> we got an Age II fan. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna argue with you a little. What, Age of Empires 3? No, 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 no. I think the campaign was better. So what happens, what happens when you have a big hit in the game business is everybody wants you to make the sequel to that big hit. And you should make that sequel because it's gonna make you a lot of money. But what, where the money really comes in a game business, if you look at any of the big publishers, they're built around just a few franchises, okay? But where do those franchises come from? They come from experimentation. They come from funding many other games with many other great development teams to try to find the next Age of Empires. So yes, you should make the sequel to Age of Empires, and you should do it well, because it's important. But you should also be doing a lot of other things to try to find 
the third you know, franchise. So you don't just have Flight Simulator and Age of Empires. You have something else great. Yes? I was going to say, um, if I had been in your shoes in that time, I would have seen how far I could push it. Because if I already <laughs> had those successes, then I would want to see like what I could come up with and how far I could go outside the box. Because you know, if I have that freedom, I don't want to waste it. I want to make something good with it. Push, push your luck. All right. Any other votes <laughs> on what I should do at this point? I like that one. <laughs> no, you already voted. <laughs> Go ahead. Make, whatever, make, your dream game, I guess. make your dream game. I like it. Anything else? Make something interesting, unique. I like it. Um, I kind of did. I did all these things. You know, uh, everything that you suggest, I did. Um, for me, but I, I thought about it maybe a little differently than what you guys are saying. I thought, I thought, well, like, this is like a free pass to do whatever I want, right? And I've been playing all these games for the last, you know, two decades. And I'm just, I look up to these great designers, these great game developers all over the world. I should just like run all around the world and meet all these guys and, 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 and get to know them and try to, try to team up with them, sign them up to make games for us, you know? So to me it was like, wow, this is an awesome opportunity to work with like my heroes in the game business. Let's go out and meet them all. You know, and that's what I did. I traveled all over the world. I met all these great game developers and, and put all kinds of deals together. And some of them worked out great. Uh, working with Chris Roberts, that didn't work out too well, even though I loved Wing Commander. Um, we did a deal with him. Um, uh, Fasa, Jordan Weissman, the makers of, of the Mech Warrior Battletech series, uh, acquired that company. Um, uh, you know, worked with Peter Molyneux worked with, uh, uh, I don't know, just pretty much everybody you could think of who was great. Tim Schafer later, into, that's getting into Xbox. Um, so for me it was like, wow, I can go out and just team up with the world's best developers and fund their work and you know, through our funding, make great new games together. Uh, and, and so that's what I saw as the opportunity. Um, and so do, did that, had a, a lot of fun personally, it was great. Um, we started to grow our group. Our group grew through acquisition and through just because we were being successful. A couple hundred people, 300 people, 400 people. And we were starting to compete. We, we were competing against Electronic Arts and Activision and people like that. And those were the guys I had my sights on. I wanted to be as big as those guys. Um, and it gets harder. The higher, the bigger your percent market share percentage is, the harder it is to grow a little bit. And it was starting to get harder and harder. And about that time, uh, these crazy guys walked into my office. Uh, they, were, they were from the DirectX team, and they said they wanted to build this DirectX box. And I'm like, what, what, do you, what do you mean? What's a DirectX box? What does that mean? And it's like, well, it's like a, you know, it's a Windows PC that runs DirectX, in a, but it's in a box. You know, <laughs> it looks like um, it looks like a game console. It acts like a game console, but really underneath, it's just a Windows PC running DirectX. And uh, this idea appealed to me for a few reasons. Uh, one is, like I said, it was getting harder to keep growing my PC market share, and I saw this huge console business out there, but I wasn't sure how we could participate in it. And yet, and now here's these guys saying, we're gonna put a PC in a box and sell it as a console. I'm thinking, I am naively, very naively thinking, wow, I can just take my PC games and just run them on this machine and now I'll be in the console business without having to change my PC games. Didn't work out that way. <laughs> but this was like, we were all naive back then when we were starting out on Xbox, for sure. Um, so, so I'm like, great, I, um, I wanna help you guys. Let's team up, I'll, I'll, help, I'll support your project. I was relatively senior at the company at, at that point and whenever people wanna do something at Microsoft, they have to gather a bunch of senior people around them to get, to get something done, right? So for them, having me supporting this project gave them more political power to go off and, and make it actually happen. Um, so that was, that was the start of, of the Xbox project. Um, oh, by the way, yeah, name, 
That was the name from the very beginning. Direct Xbox is shortened to Xbox. The marketing people hated it <laughs> because they didn't come up with it. Um, they came up with many, many other names, and they would go out and they would market test them, and they'd always put Xbox in, uh, you know, just to test against. And they never, none of their names ever worked better than Xbox, and it drove them crazy, you know. Um, and finally, they had to give in and just let it be the code name. It's one of the few projects I've worked on where the code name shipped as the product name. Go ahead. Uh, can you tell us some of the other names? Uh, I know people ask me, and I don't, it's like any dumb thing you can think of. You know? <laughs> really is. Uh, I, I honestly don't remember. I, sh I, should, I should go look through some old paperwork and, and get a list so I can answer this. It's a fine question. So anyway. Um, Okay, so now we get into some Microsoft politics and then some more Microsoft politics. Uh, so um, it turned out we were not the only group at Microsoft that wanted to make a game console. There were a group of ex-3DO guys who had come into the company through an acquisition, and they were in charge of something called Windows CE, which is the embedded version of Windows. And they were trying to put it um, into game, into game consoles, and they had made a deal with Sega Dreamcast. Does anybody here ever have a Sega Dreamcast? Okay. Well, if you have a Sega Dreamcast, you might notice there's a little Windows logo like on one corner of it, and Microsoft paid some dumb amount of money to Sega to put this logo on there, and there was actually a way to boot the Dreamcast in Windows mode, which I've never done. Have you done it? So the project was a big success. <laughs> but anyway, the point was that these guys had done a whole deal with Sega, and they were, you know, they, so they kind of, in their mind, they owned this idea of Microsoft going into the console world. And, and the Xbox team was sort of the, um, their enemies. Um, and so then you, what happens in a big company like Microsoft is both teams uh, who are claiming the same sort of territory, they have to have a rumble, you know, they have to have a battle for that. And the way those battles work is you get all your vice presidents together. So, so we rounded up as many vice presidents as we could to support our project, and they rounded up a bunch of vice presidents to support their project. And then when there's a bunch of vice presidents disagreeing, who has to decide? Well, it's, it's Bill and Steve, right? The, the heads of the company. So then we go into this big meeting, and we have to win this battle for the right to go forward with Xbox. And they pitched a thing that was very much like a PlayStation. It was gonna be completely custom hardware, it was gonna be completely custom software, um, and it was gonna just be this screaming game machine. And we laughed at them, we're like, ha, you are so off strategy. <laughs> this is, a, this is the, like the worst thing you could say to somebody at Microsoft, you're off strategy. <laughs> that, that plan is off strategy. It's not using any other Microsoft resources. We're talking about building a machine that's like a PC. It's just like a PC. It runs Windows, for God's sake. We're on strategy. Windows, PC, x86 architecture. Come on. Uh, so we won. So we won. <laughs> so, this is, the, this is what you want me to talk about, right? The, the, how the Xbox really was created. Um, so we win that first battle. And this is like, uh, it would have been 1999, okay? Um, and uh, basically what winning that gave us was a year to get our act together, to really, enough, enough resources to hire a team and really dig into this idea of getting Microsoft in the console business and build a business case and all that. And we did that. We went off for a year, we built this whole business case, we figured out everything. And along the way, funny things happened. The more we looked at it, the more we kept going, oh, you know, those, those other guys were kind of right. <laughs> you know, they were kind of right. You know, we don't really want to run all of Windows because uh, you know, Windows is kind of big, it takes up a lot of memory, we want to give the game developers as much of the machine as we possibly can. Maybe we could just run a little bit of Windows. <laughs> you know? How little of Windows could we run? <laughs> you know? So the system guys are trying to figure out how little of Windows they can put on this thing. And, uh, you know, we hung on, our thing had a hard disk and theirs didn't, and we hung on to the hard disk 
we thought the hard disk was really going to be a differentiating factor for us. And if you look at game consoles today, they all have storage of some kind, uh, you know, whether it's SD drive or, or, or hard disk like device. Uh, and no, no console before that had had it. So that was, we thought was important. Um, but more and more, and, and, and by the way, when we won this battle, a lot of these guys joined our team, right? And so I think there was a little bit of, you know, subversive uh, work going on too, like bringing us over to their side. But anyway, the point is after a year, we, um, we were somewhere in between what we had originally pitched and what they had originally pitched. And uh, this leads up to probably the, the main story that I want to tell you guys, which, which is uh, a, a really important meeting we had. And uh, it's called the Valentine's Day Massacre among people who were there. Okay, And this is when we met with Bill and Steve to get the final approval. Okay, It was on Valentine's Day in February, year 2000. Uh, and it was scheduled to run from like 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock at night. And the idea was that we would, we're going to meet in the boardroom, the most important meeting room in all of Microsoft. Bill and Steve and many vice presidents are going to be there. And we're going to show them this year's worth of work. And, and we're either going to get the thumbs up to go forward on Xbox or thumbs down and the project will be disbanded. Okay, So it's a high stakes meeting. And if we got the thumbs up, we had already set up for uh, Bill Gates to announce it at, at Game Developers Conference the next month in March. And that would be the launch of this big project. So my boss, Robbie Bach, he was normally really good at something that we called pre-disastering. Okay, <laughs> And the way pre-disastering works is, and he was the master of pre-disastering, so I'm not sure why he failed in this one important case. But the way pre-disastering works is he would go to Bill and Steve like weeks ahead of an important meeting, and he would tell them all the bad things that they're going to hear when we meet with them. And so we would go in and we would meet with them, and there would be sometimes like other teams would be there too, and Bill and Steve are yelling at these other teams, and then we would walk in and we'd have just as bad news as they did. But ours was pre-disaster. So, you know, Bill and Steve would just nod, and you know, because it was all stuff they already knew. It was just like, okay, fine, yeah, we'll just do what we said we we're gonna do. Okay, somehow Robbie did not pre-disaster for this meeting. So so we walk into this meeting, we're all we're early, you know, we're all around the table, we're not sure what's gonna happen. We know, we know we have some bad news in our presentation. We know that it if you look at the numbers, which they're going to do, it says we're going to lose more than a billion dollars on this project. Um, and also, that thing about Windows, eh, it's not really, it doesn't really, okay, it doesn't run Windows at all. <laughs> <laughs> pretty, mu pretty much what we had promised a year before, it wasn't in there. So, um, so Balmer comes in and sits down. Uh, as I remember, Bill came in last. He had printed out our PowerPoint deck. He had it in his hand. He throws it down on the boardroom table. This is the opening of the meeting. He throws it down on the table. He says, this is a bleeping insult to everything I've accomplished at this company. Okay. That was the opening line. <laughs> and um, I know why he's mad. He's mad about Windows. So I, I, I'm, just, I'm just a game guy, right? So, so I look over to Jay Allard, the system software guy. You know, it's like, here you go, Jay. <laughs> and he's like, Jay was normally really good at standing up to Bill and Steve. Uh, but this night, it, it wasn't working yet. It was like, I could just see there was, the brain was not connected to the mouth yet. So, so all right, he needs a little break. So, so I step in, and I try to defend it. And Bill and Steve yell at me. And then my boss steps in and tries to defend it, and Bill and Steve yell at them. And the more Bill yelled, the more Steve yelled. You know? And so Bill was yelling about all the, you know, that it's, you know, it's not running Windows, it's off strategy, blah, 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 all this stuff. And Steve is running about uh, yelling, and this is the way they worked, is they were a really good team together. Steve is yelling about the business case. You know, it says you're going to lose this much money, and why would you, you know, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So they yelled at us from 4 o'clock. Five o'clock, six o'clock, seven o'clock. Now, this is Valentine's Day, okay? <laughs> so, 
I mean, most of us, you know, if we were either married or we had girlfriends or, I mean, it's Valentine's Day. We had dinner reservations, you know. I mean, we're all looking at our watches, you know. And, and we're, so we're not only in trouble at work, we're in trouble at home now too, right? We got, we're, this is getting serious. Um, and, you know, and, and we just kept saying the same thing. You know, we were, we're just like, look, we've looked at this for a year. We're very confident that this, if you want to get into the game business, if you want to get into the game console business, this is the best way for Microsoft to do it. We spent a year figuring it out. Yes, it's going to lose some money. Um, you know, yes, it doesn't run Windows, but this is the best way for us to go forward. Um, and so we're just saying that over and over and over and over again. And Robbie and I both came from office, and we were used to uh, arguing with Bill and Steve and saying no to them sometimes, which they didn't like to hear, but we knew sometimes you just got to say no to them, you know? Um, in this case, we needed them to say yes, so it was a little harder. But um, So we're doing this, and you know, it's after 7 o'clock, maybe it's 7.30 or something, and they've just yelled at us constantly. Um, and, and one kind of less, lesser known vice president in the back raises his hand and, you know, at, when there's like a lull in the yelling. And he just, he just says three things, He's, three words. He says, he says, what about Sony? That's all he says. Now, now the reason this particular guy said one about, what about Sony is he has been writing these almost conspiracy level memos for a year, maybe two years, <laughs> um, about what a threat to the company Sony represented. That that you know Sony Sony, in his world was was circumventing Microsoft in the home. Okay, they were gonna they were putting they were effectively building a home PC, but they were doing it in a really sneaky way by putting the processor in a game console and the disk storage in a TiVo-like device. And you know, I mean, it was, and it was all gonna come together in this master conspiracy theory plan that Sony's gonna all of a sudden be in a position where they own the living room, okay? And Microsoft will never be able to get it back. All right. So, and everybody in this room knew this theory. Everyone had read these memos. <laughs> what they thought about them would be varied, but, um, but, uh, he had found a welcome audience with Bill and Steve. And so when he says this, he says, what about Sony? And um, they look at each other. And Bill says, what about Sony? <laughs> and Balmer says, yeah, what about Sony? And Bill says, we're going to do this. <laughs> And Balmer says, yeah, we're going to do this, you know, like Balmer. And, and then they're like, and then they get all excited, and then they're like, this is great. We're going to get, we're 110% behind you guys. We're going to give you guys everything you wanted. You wanted to be off in your own building so nobody could disturb you. You've got that. You've got, you know, every, every last thing that you want. This is a really important mission for this company. You guys go off and do this plan. You have our 100% blessing. Go do it. <laughs> <laughs> and we walked out of there, you know, around around eight o'clock at night, and um, and I just I remember turning to my boss Robbie Bach, and and just saying, that was the weirdest meeting I've been in <laughs> in fifteen years at Microsoft or whatever it was, and that that was the start of Xbox, and uh, and Bill, true to his word, he was gave us everything we wanted. We had all the resources we needed. Um, he showed up at a uh, game developers conference and took the cloth off the big weird silver X-shaped prototype that we had. Um, for me, I was, I walked out of there happy and sad at the same time because I knew I was responsible for building the first party launch portfolio and it was February 2000 and the console was going to launch in November 2001. Now, so I had less than two years to somehow magically pull a, a set of games together for a platform that didn't exist, where the hardware wouldn't even exist for over a year. Uh, so I was kind of nervous about it. Um, 
But, um, but it was exciting. It was really fun. It was fun to be part of a big adventure with the company and fun to have the full support of the executives at the company. Um, and, uh, and then we went forward from there. So I, I'll, I'll go forward, but maybe I'll pause a little bit and see if there's any questions up till now. Yeah, go ahead. So how did your team deal with the pressure from Sony yeah, so how do we deal with the pressure from Sony and PlayStation? Um, I had been at Microsoft a long time at this point, and I was used to fighting big competitors, and it's kind of, by that point, it's kind of like what I like to do, you know? So like when I was on Excel, we were fighting Lotus 1, 2, 3. When, I, when we, we were doing Excel, Lotus was bigger than all of Microsoft. And you know, we had seven guys making our, our spreadsheet there. So I liked being the underdog within Microsoft, it's hard to think of Microsoft today as an underdog, but the teams I worked on were always underdogs. Um, whether it was Excel fighting Lotus 1, 2, 3, Word fighting Word Perfect, which was by far the biggest word processor out there. Um, when we were doing PC games, there were giants like Electronic Arts and others out there. Um, so to me, it was just another one of the fights that I like to fight you know, against these big companies. Sony and Nintendo, right? Um, <laughs> Sony had done a lot of, th Sony had been really arrogant. They had pissed off a lot of developers. Um, in Japan, the developers really were conflicted because Sony, they were, they saw that Sony had so much pressure on the, so much control of the market that the developers didn't like that. So, so when we came in, it's like, oh good, here's someone who can, now there can be like two big companies Maybe I can play them off against each other. Is probably what they were what they were saying, you know, to themselves. But they, you know, they could at least say, well, here's a company that could stand up to Sony. So we took advantage of that when we could. Um, one of the first deals that I did was sign up a guy named Lorne Lanning, who did the Odd World series, um, and um, that was kind of the first big Xbox announcement that we made. There's a funny Penny Arcade cartoon about it from the time, where Lorne Lorne is standing there. And they're, they're asking him, why, did he, why would he go to Microsoft to work on this console? And he's saying, spouting all the marketing lines about why the console's so great. But he's wearing this hat made of money. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and in the last panel, he says, oh, and they gave me this hat made of money, which was more or less true. Um, but um, so, so we tried to steal their developers when we could. You know, later, I, I would sort of steal Rare from Nintendo and you know, was that kind of thing. Um, but, um, but also, Sony, the, a lot of the developers didn't like working with Sony. Sony, was the, the system was hard to work with. Um, and so we were, we were putting out an architecture that was very PC-like, very, um, so it was uh, just more familiar to developers, easier to work on. We had some kind of standard tools if you'd ever built a PC game. And we ended up really, really where we were successful was when we reached out into the PC development community who wanted to be in the console business. And, you know, and the biggest example of that is when we went out and bought this company that was going out of business, this little company in Chicago called Bungie. Um, and um, they had been, they had put out like a prototype. They'd always been a Mac developer first, although I had played a bunch of their games on the PC. Um, they, um, they called me one day and said that they were, they were running out of money, they were gonna go out of business, and unless someone else helped them, they would, uh, and they were already a third owned by the company Take Two, the publisher Take Two. Um, unless someone else stepped in, they were going to be fully bought by Take Two. Um, and they had this thing they were working on called Halo. Um, and um, they asked if I was interested. And I'm like, yes, I'm very interested. You know, I played your games, they're awesome. I got to get a lineup in, you know, done for the console, you know, when we launched this console in. November 2001 and um, you know of course they lied and said that was possible <laughs> they actually did it though it's good you know those guys they're amazing guys really 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 amazing guys but anyway um, and so we brought them out and uh, I, I spent a bunch of time on the phone with the head of, of uh, take two and I made a deal and I said um, okay we'll split this company you can have um, another game that they're, they're making called Oni. We'll let them finish Oni, and then you can have that. Um, you can have all their back catalog of all their old games and make sequels of those. 
I only want two things. All I want is this new thing called Halo and all the developers. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that was the deal we made. It was a good deal. Um, and uh, so anyway, um, but we had lots of projects going on. We probably had 40 or 50 Xbox projects by the end of that summer going on. And some of them, you know, turned out and some of them didn't. Um, uh, Project Gotham Racing was a, another game that we did that was a, an important part of our launch, ti uh, launch titles. We had our own football game. We had, anyway, uh, we, had, we had, I think we launched with seven titles and then we had a few more that came uh, between launch in November and Christmas. Um, but I think I was taking questions, so let me see if there's more questions. Oh, sorry. Yeah, when did we start using consoles, which may be a, a veiled, polite question about asking why we put out this giant console called the, or giant controller called the Duke controller. <laughs> so I, I appreciate your, your subtlety in your question. <laughs> um, we were one of the first, and certainly the biggest hardware, pieces of hardware that Microsoft ever did. I mean, Microsoft actually did a mouse back in the day. We had a small group that did uh, uh, keyboards, and they actually did some joysticks and the, even a, a, a controller. Um, there was something called the Sidewinder controller, okay? Um, and so, and also, one of the first guys to come over to help us put the business plan to Xbox together was a guy named Rick Thompson. And Rick ran the hardware group. So we're like, let's get the guy who actually knows how to make hardware, and he can help us put the business case together. So he puts this business case together that says we're gonna lose well over a billion dollars. And he's like, I'm out of here. <laughs> I, I don't like to work on money losing businesses. It's just not my thing. So, so he quits. Um, and and uh, that's when Robbie, my boss, who was, anyway, it's complicated, but anyway, that's when he kind of took over the whole project. Um, so when we're developing Xbox, the, the hardware group at Microsoft is developing the controller. And, and we're, they got that covered. They've got years of experience making keyboards and force feedback joysticks and controllers. So we're not even thinking about that. And they suggest this controller. And honestly, nobody on, it, there were so many other things we were worried about, like, you know, the thing catching on fire and stuff like that. Uh, the fact that our graphics part was running at half the speed it was supposed to run at E3, which was just a few months before launch, um, that it was, it was almost out of our mind. The only thing that sort of saved us was the Japanese guys were telling us, this controller sucks. <laughs> and I had a lot of experience working in Japan, and and I still love Japan. In fact, I was talking earlier, I'm a huge anime fan, and I'm just, I'm finally getting around to watching this anime called New Game. And if you, I think some of you have seen it. If you haven't seen it, I'm just double thumbs up for New Game. It's like really, really good. Um, but anyway, uh, so like I'm going to Japan fairly regularly, which I love, I love Japan. And, and they're giving me this weird Japanese feedback. And so they would say stuff to me, this is a direct quote, they would say, the controller should feel the same as, as water in your hands. You know, I'm like, what does that mean? You know? <laughs> and then they would also say these like dire things, like, you know, like, you cannot call it Xbox. Xbox, X is the letter of death. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll pass that along. Um, and then they say, and they say, and it cannot be black. Black is the color of death. <laughs> and I'm looking at the PlayStation and it's black. You know, I'm like, but, you know, but, you know, so it's like sometimes it was like different rules for foreign things than domestic things, you know? So we didn't take them that seriously, but they really were complaining about the, the controller and we're like, fine, we'll make will make a special controller just for the Japanese because they claim their hands are, are, are smaller than ours or something. It's like, fine, okay, <laughs> don't do that. So, they, so, so there's this whole separate track to make this separate controller. 
we launch, the biggest complaint we have by far is that this giant controller is too big. I actually have a, my, my son, my first son was born just a few months after. He was actually born a month after the Japanese launch. He was born in March of 2002. And so, of course, I named him after the Xbox. His name is Xander, X-A-N-D-E-R. Um, but I have a picture of him as a baby hold, like holding the Duke controller, and it's the size of him, and it's like crushing him. And he's screaming. His like, arms and legs are sticking out, and his face is screaming. So it's, if, if you search on Twitter or something, you'll probably see where, where I posted it. But, um, but anyway, yeah, so we launched. People hated the controller, and really fortunately, we had this Japanese controller. Um, and so we just substituted that in worldwide as quickly as we could. Uh, yes? Uh, so when you're in a situation where like the estimates are that you're going to lose like a billion dollars, so what motivated you to keep on going till the end, basically? I didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, honestly, I mean, first of all, a billion dollars wasn't that much for the company to lose at that time. The company was, was cranking out so many billions of dollars in profit from the big businesses like Windows and Office. And the biggest, the biggest problem Bill and Steve had is trying to find another business that they could get in that was worth it, you know, that was big enough to matter. Um, either they have to start like 100 little businesses, all of which are gonna contribute this tiny amount, or what's something big we can do you know, and when you try to do something big, it's going to cost some money. You know, maybe we'll lose money on the first one. Okay, definitely we're going to lose money on the first one, but maybe on the second one we can make money, or the third one, or maybe Bill and Steve are thinking, you know, at that time, PlayStation business was forty percent of Sony's profit, um, and now it's even higher. A profit, okay, it was most of the profit of this company. Um, Maybe if we lose a billion dollars, but we make them lose three billion dollars, maybe that's okay. Um, so I don't know exactly what they're thinking is. All, all I care about is I want to build fantastic game business. I want to work with awesome game developers all around the world. I want to bring new games into creation that wouldn't happen otherwise. And where that money's coming from to fund that, that's okay. That's, that's my thinking, honestly. Yeah. Um, when you guys were creating Age of Empires, how did you like decide? Because it's obviously kind of uh, ingenious for the time. It was very different from everything like Warcraft. Yeah. Conquer. How did you create like uh, what set you on the path to make something so different? So why? I'm going to change your question slightly. Why was Ensemble so successful? where making games is hard and other people fail. And I've seen lots of different ways that game companies can be successful, and I'll tell you what theirs was. It was really two things. One is they had the teamiest team I have ever seen of teams. And what I mean by that is every single person I ever talked to who worked there would say this weird thing. They'd say, you know, I've worked at other companies, but working at Ensemble was like being part of the family. Um, and I just kept hearing that over and over. I'm like, what does that even mean? You know, and I'd go down there and I'd meet with them. You know, and, and I learned that it was like that. It was almost like a cult. <laughs> like, for one thing, they had a rule that um, only any person, oh, every person in the company got to interview every new hire. Okay? And if any one person didn't feel comfortable, said no, they were out. Yeah. It's not like this Kavanaugh thing where it's like 50-50. No, it's like one, one person. Sorry, I shouldn't even go there. Um, it's nothing, nothing good to come out of that. Um, anyway, so, so the, there was the family environment. Um, and then the other thing was they played the hell out of their game. They played it and played it and played it and played it and played it. They got it working really early, and they polished and polished and polished. And they would play at lunch and they would all stay after work and play and they would just play and play and play and fix and play and fix and that's really what you see I think when you see that game is the polish you know just how well that game is made um, and, you know we made a few mistakes like we we shortened the name of the this Korean race uh, their, their actual name was called the old Chosan but we felt like that was too long so we just shortened it to Chosan 
Yeah, the Koreans didn't like that very much. They threatened to arrest the country manager for Korea, and it was like this whole big thing, you know. <laughs> Uh, stuff like that happens when you're making games. We learned about the importance of <sighs> globalism and checking stuff like that. <laughs> but anyway, really, honestly, that was that was the secret for them. Uh, really, really, the secret. Yeah. Um, after your Valentine's Day fun time with Bill and Steve, did you ever have any other incidents after that? Like, like right before the release came out, were they like, "Ooh, I don't like it, so we're gonna make it black," or something like that? Or did they do like you're talking about the controller? Did they have like some issues? With Bill and Steve? Yeah. Um, I would say Bill and Steve at that point uh, were just, they, they really kept to their word of staying out of it and supporting us. And, uh, you know, if we needed Bill at a press event or something, he was there in New York City when we launched November 15th, 2001. Uh, you know, so they, they were very supportive. Um, and Balmer later became really in love with Xbox Live. And the idea that we could have this subscription relationship with our customer. He really, I saw him destroy a Polycom telephone in a meeting. He got so excited. He was pounding the table and he didn't look where he was pounding. He hit the telecom. Hit, yeah. He was, he was like that. He was energetic. Genki, as the Japanese would say. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that's a great question. Why, why Halo? Um, it was a really hard, uh, well, a few things. Um, internally, we all loved Halo. Uh, people would stay late and play Halo at night. We, we knew the team was super talented. Um, but every time we talked to people like in the industry, the game reviewers, they were really not sure. They're like, this feels like a PC game. It just shows you guys don't understand consoles. You don't understand the console audience. Somebody said the colors are all wrong. It should be bright and colorful. Uh, who's your Mario? Is, <laughs> is the Master Chief your Mario? Uh, so we would, and, and we're new to this, right? So you never know. It's like I was saying with the Japanese. Who do you listen to, right? Um, and so uh, uh, the E3 showing was relatively disastrous because we had this half-speed hardware, and they had decided to show four-player split-screen co-op, which um, was super cool that they could do that, but it was slow and didn't show very well. So anyway, it was actually really hard, and I would say that we didn't pick it, that we, we came in to launch, we, had, we, we allocated equal amounts of marketing for uh, Munch's Odyssey, Lorne Lanning's game, and for Halo. And they both, we had fortunately a lot of marketing money, so we could do both, and we had TV ads for both, and we spent equal on both. And of course, Halo was the killer. Yeah. I've seen Log Horizon, thanks. <laughs> um, I've, seen the, I've, seen, I've, seen, I've seen every episode of One Piece, just to give you <laughs> But anyway, we won't go there, we don't have time. I'm, I'm actually like, I've got my last minute. How do you make your mark personally at an indie studio, is that? I think the most important, I love, I know some great indies in this area. Um, you know, like uh, Double Damage, I think, is a great example. They just launched this, this Re Rebel Galaxy game, which is, is similar to a game we made back in the day called Freelancer. Um, but they did it like with a tenth of the resources and half the time. You know, the, those studios. The main thing that they do is they are incredibly multi-talented. Um, you know, the, the the guy who runs the studio is an artist, a designer a musician, and a killer programmer, you know? Um, and, and so it, it's really, I think, important to be multifunctional if you're gonna go in. And I see the opposite. I see AAA guys, and I'll, I'll, I'm, I have coffee with these guys all the time. I wanna leave my big company and, and make a game company with a few friends. And I'm like, well, what do you do? And they're like, oh, I'm a, you know, uh, character 